Welcome to this webinar, which is the final one in light of the COVID-19 crisis and which replaces our Nordic Summit. My name is Thomas Haar and I'm responsible for research at Danske Bank. To my right, I have the great pleasure to have our Chief Portfolio Manager at Danske Bank, Bo Beistrup Christensen. We are currently witnessing the beginning of recoveries as economies open up. Chances are, I think, at least that's what the market are saying, that the recovery may initially be relatively fast. But the economic scars in terms of lost output will be huge and there will be setbacks. The policy measures have been extraordinary in terms of debt build up and you can argue that maybe central banks are doing monetary financing. Central banks have, done, have gone at great length support, supporting the private sector. Again, you can think, are they actually in and taking something which is more like political decision? Meanwhile, the crisis has demonstrated that we did not have the resilient system in place in dealing with the pandemic, at least in terms of coordination maybe across countries. To analyze these and other issues, I'm very glad to introduce a former Bank of England governor, Lord Mervyn King. Mervyn has just published a book, we just talked about it before with Mervyn. It's a very interesting book, it's, it's about radical uncertainty, a concept he introduced in his book back in 2016. Um, and I think COVID-19 is actually a very good example of that. And it's very important for how we're going to design also policies going forward. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, as Thomas said, my name is Bo. I run uh, tactical risk taking on our multi-asset products in uh, Danske Bank as management. Uh, by the way, this is my first time doing a webinar, so if I stumble a few times, uh, please bear with me. Um, I'm going to provide you with a little bit of practical information. Uh, so uh, immediately after my short intro, uh, Mr. King will give a, a 20 to 25 minute uh, speech and talk. Uh, after that, we will have a Q&A session, uh, which will last for roughly speaking 25 to 30 minutes. You will see a button floating at the top left corner of your screen. Uh, you can press and then you can submit your question. Um, obviously, we will not, most likely not be able to go through all of them, but please do ask the questions. We will ask as many as we can. Um, you can submit, submit them now already um, and obviously during the talk and discussion. Thomas and I have prepared a few topics uh, to get us started in the Q&A. Uh, we are expecting to talk about uh, the current policy responses and, and how we eventually sort of uh, get out of what we are currently in. We will try to draw parallels to, uh, to previous crises. Uh, we will be talking about how we build a resilient and, and robust uh, global system of policy making given uh, radical uncertainty. And finally, if we have time, of course, uh, we will also discuss global uh, policy co coordination in a time of increasingly fragile international relations. So without further ado, Mr. King, please do um, start. Thank you. Well, Bo, thank you very much indeed. And I, I'm sorry that I can't join you in person. I'd hoped to be with you all at the Nordic Summit, but circumstances have obviously uh, prevented that. Another year, perhaps. But at least we have the opportunity now to try and think through the consequences were one of the most extraordinary events that have occurred in our lifetime. As Bo said, this really is an example of radical uncertainty. We knew that pandemics could occur, so it certainly wasn't an example of a black swan event where we couldn't even imagine such a thing happening. And many countries have been ranked in terms of their abilities to prepare for a pandemic. Not that that in the event turned out to be a good predictor of how prepared they actually were. But the essence of this was that before the beginning of this year, none of us could really have thought in terms of the probability that a virus would come out of Wuhan in China and lead to a highly infectious uh, epidemic of a disease that killed large numbers of people. But we'll come back at the end, I think, to how we might have prepared for it if we had been thinking more deeply about the existence of pandemics. The point I want to focus on at this stage is that because we can't attach probabilities to such events, most models have serious limitations. And this is true not just of economic models, where we know that they have been pretty poor at predicting big changes in the economy. In fact, models, economic forecasting models have been quite good at telling you if nothing really is happening. You don't really need a model to know that. It's just one year follows the next quite naturally. But big changes are not well predicted by economic models. And we saw that in the case of the financial crisis just over a decade ago. 
But of course, what is fascinating is that the epidemiological models also failed us in this crisis. What the models are good at doing is giving us a qualitative understanding of various phenomena. They give us insights. So the epidemiological models gave us the important insight <clears throat> that epidemics start very slowly and that it's very hard to really notice how serious they're likely to be at that stage. But by the time you realize you've got one on your hands, it starts accelerating away from you, reaches a peak, and then naturally declines and you may get second or third waves. Understanding that is very important in formulating policy. But what the models were bad at doing was actually predicting the precise course of the epidemic. And the reason for that is exactly the same as the reason why economic models are also not very good at forecasting. And there are two reasons. The first is that the world is not stationary that the forces that govern both the economy and in this case the epidemic change over time. The virus was a new one, the scientists had, didn't really know a lot about it and we're still learning about it. So radical uncertainty was relevant not just to the existence of the pandemic but also to every facet of it and we're still discovering new features of it today. And that means that when we come to think in terms of the recovery and how we get out of this we should also expect it to be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to make quantitative forecasts of how the, both the epidemic and the economy will respond. So the fact that the economy is non-stationary uh, and that the science behind the virus is also non-stationary makes it very difficult to forecast. That's the first reason why the models can't easily be used to make predictive uh, quantitative predictions about the course of the epidemic and the economy. The second one, which is important to both economics and epidemiology, is that the behavior of the economy or the disease depends on human behavior, human responses and reactions to the measures which governments put in place. And very often in the case of unpredictable events where we're dealing with unique events that we haven't really seen before in the same shape, then human behavior is inherently unpredictable. And that's one reason why the economy is very hard to predict. Expectations do not always follow what are called rational expectations. That is, if we, a model can be helpful in thinking about the economy, but it isn't a description of the world. And so expectations consistent with the model are also not necessarily good descriptions of the sentiment and expectations that players in the economy have. And exactly as the same is true of COVID-19 and this epidemic. The, certainly in the UK, and my guess is around the whole of Europe, if not the world as a whole, governments face the terribly difficult challenge of trying to understand how people would change their behavior if they announced various restrictive measures. Lockdowns, if you make it tough enough and, and police it, you may be able to guarantee that people stay indoors. But in a democratic society, it's never entirely clear how people will respond. And it may well be, as we saw in, certainly in Sweden, that as long as people understand the reason for social distancing, then you may not need to enforce it with a lockdown. So human behavior is difficult to predict. And this is particularly important now as we're coming out of it. Because in the United Kingdom, people have been made extremely conscious of the dangers of this disease. I think the, the way the government's approached this has frightened people. And so now they may well be rather unwilling to go back to work in the way that they were doing before. So, <clears throat> It's very difficult to make quantitative predictions, and we'll come back to the, the different challenges that the, we will face for that in a minute. But the, the, the next point I want to make uh, is that this downturn that we're experiencing is not best thought of as a conventional recession or even a depression. Recessions and depressions in conventional economic language are occasions when the private sector basically decides to stop spending. They're generated from within the private sector, possibly through government 
measures to change interest rates, but nevertheless, it's the response of the private sector. What we've been through recently is quite different. It's a government mandated shutdown of the economy. People have been told they cannot go to work. And if that's the case, it doesn't make much sense for the government to try to hold the economy down with one hand and then to try and stimulate it with the other. The time for a monetary and fiscal stimulus is not today, it's when we come out of this and when all the restrictions have been lifted. At that point, the market economy will be uh, able to operate again in a way that it can't now. The, the key point I want to stress on the overall macroeconomic outcome is that the economic cost of what we're going through is not measured by the impact on public finances, but by the impact on GDP. It's quite natural, I think, within government and within many economic forecasting circles where they've got a conventional model, which they have to use both to normal business cycle downturns and to this episode because they're stuck with their model. It's natural, I think, for people to divide into two groups. Those with responsibility for thinking about health issues, who focus entirely on the damage that's being caused by the deaths from the virus itself um, and the burden on health systems. And the other group are people in finance ministries, economists, concerned about the damage being done to the economy. What the governments really have to do is to think of this as a trade-off. As we come out of it, there is going to be a trade-off between the risk that we're prepared to take with further spread of the disease and the possibility of a second peak and the damage being done to the economy. It's very difficult at present to judge the precise scale of the damage because statisticians don't have access to the normal sources of information to judge measures of inflation, which they really need in order to convert measures of revenues and nominal spending into real GDP. So I think we should take estimates of the fall in GDP and the subsequent rise with a big pinch of salt. And given that this is not a conventional downturn, I think we really need to understand that in some ways, we, we are talking about the need to think in terms of very big round numbers. 10 to 20% of annual GDP looks like being the sort of cost of this crisis in economic terms. Of course, there is a medical and health cost as well, because people are dying from non-COVID diseases who might otherwise have had earlier and better treatment. And those who have not been able to complete their education will also be suffering losses that may last for some considerable time. So the challenge to government is to manage this trade-off. A lot of the comment in the media focuses on the public finances of this whole situation. I don't think this is helpful at this point. I think if the government decides that having made its trade-off judgment between the cost to the economy and the measures needed to deal with the, the disease, COVID-19, if the government decides that it wants to shut down the economy, then the government has a responsibility to provide support for the lost incomes and revenues that businesses would otherwise have been expected to earn. And that will go on for quite some time until the restrictions have all disappeared. Many countries in Europe have sensibly adopted schemes to maintain employment, to replace to employers the cost of labour on condition that labour is sent on furlough and not made redundant. I think that was a sensible move, but it's led to a very big increase in public debt. But public debt is there precisely to be able to respond <clears throat> to a major crisis when we see one. And uh, I, I think it's important that we don't get too hung up on the big jump in the national debt. The time to worry about that will be once we have a vaccine and got through the virus and we think it's behind us. I think I'm assuming here that acquiring a vaccine is going to be the only end path to this disease. 
once we've had that, then we can think seriously about getting back to normal in terms of economic policy. At that point, for countries where the primary surplus on the public budget is close to zero, that is excluding interest payments, revenues roughly match expenditures, then it will be the case that governments can borrow at long-term real interest rates, which would in all likelihood be below the growth rate of the economy, provided we don't damage that by imposing unnecessarily strong austerity. So it ought to be possible to cope relatively straightforwardly with the public finance implications in those countries which have pretty well managed budgets. Of course, in countries like Italy, where they have very high ratios of public debt to GDP, there is a bigger challenge, although actually their budget balance is not in too bad a shape. So I don't think the public finance costs are the biggest problem we face here. It's the loss of GDP and the associated loss of well-being uh, that's associated with that reduction in GDP. As we come out of the restrictions and we're gradually moving to a period in which I think the government has no choice but to adopt a trial and error strategy, we just don't know enough to calibrate successfully the timing of ending of restrictions. Governments will try it if we see that it doesn't lead to significant rise in infections, we can unlock even more parts of the economy. But we don't know the behavioural responses and we shall just have to see. The worry is, I think, not that households won't have the money to spend. So I don't think monetary and fiscal stimulus is the immediate order of the day. But will they have the confidence to spend, certainly in particular directions? And that leads me to <clears throat> some comments on the long run implications of this. As I said, I think trying to characterize the path of the economy from the middle of this year through to the end of next year, in terms of a V-shaped, W-shaped, L-shaped, or any other kind of shape, doesn't actually, it's a shorthand for saying we don't know. And I think it's better to try and think through ourselves. There are some signs that many businesses and some consumer activity is raring to go once they're released from the lockdown. But there are plenty of other signs where sectors of the economy will be hesitant and that will have knock-on effects on other local industries. So for example, in a city like London or Copenhagen, what we do not know is how people will be willing to go back to eat in restaurants close by with others, to go to crowded theatres or cinemas or concert halls, will they do that quickly? If they don't, then the life of the city won't return in quite the same way. That could affect property values, could affect decisions to slow down investment in construction in those areas. Many of these things, there is no basis on the from past history to easily form a judgment on all that, we'll just have to wait and see. So I think surveys of current activity and sentiment will be very important in trying to form a judgment as to where the economy is likely to go. But I think there are five aspects to the long run consequences of this, which are worth identifying. The first one is that the pattern of demand and output is likely to change, though it's hard to judge by how much. I think there is a reasonable hope that the scale of GDP in aggregate will get back to something close to where we were before too long. But the pattern of demand and output will be somewhat different. We know it's easy to identify sectors like hospitality, airlines, travel, especially business travel, where demand may be much less, and IT, video communications, where demand will be much greater. But how far this will go, I think, is, is hard to judge. Just let me give you one small example, which is in itself not very significant, but it's, it, 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 it is illustrative, I think, of the challenges that lie ahead. Most universities around the world succeeded in switching from teaching in person 
to remote teaching really very quickly. And some universities have made a tremendous success of this. Now they know they can do it, people will start asking the question, will students really want to take on so much debt to be a full-time student for three or four years, where for half the year they're on vacation, the other half they're not. Why can't we design courses now which are a mixture of virtual teaching and residential and reduce drastically the time that a degree takes to acquire? Now, that restructuring is something that people have been talking about for some while, hasn't really taken off. And I think one of the lessons from the past about different kinds of crises is, is that things happen in a crisis because you're forced to do it. And then that changes how you behave in the future. It's not that you couldn't have done it before, you could, but the impetus to doing it wasn't there. <clears throat> so I think certainly when it comes to investment decisions and portfolio analysis, it's not going to be easy to make judgments about the uh, implication of changes and the pattern of demand and output across economies. The second long run consequence, I think, is that one of the lessons we learned from this and other crises is that resilience and robustness are fundamentally important characteristics, not just of government policies, but of businesses as well. This was a lesson that we learned after the financial crisis. The banking system was a critical system in the economy. And before 2008, we had allowed the banking system to become far from resilient and robust. Its holdings of liquid assets had been run down. It didn't have enough uh, equity buffers to absorb the scale of losses that could result from a crisis. And as a result, the system had to be bailed out by the state. Now, we learned the lesson from that, and we made banks issue more equity so they could absorb losses. And we created new systems of liquidity provision and liquidity regulation. The strange thing is, when it comes to a pandemic, the same problem has occurred, and we didn't anticipate in advance the need to make our health systems more resilient and robust. So, somewhat ironically, the United States the United Kingdom were the countries judged to be the best prepared for a pandemic before this epidemic actually hit us. On paper, that may well have been true. The committee structures looked excellent, lots of scientists involved. But when it came to it, the preparations did not work on the ground. And so making something resilient and robust isn't just a paper exercise, it's making sure you know you can make things actually work. And there's no doubt that businesses will also ask themselves questions that if they want to have a long run future, it's not enough just to be lean and efficient in normal times. It's also important to have the ability to survive a crisis and to be resilient and robust. And things like just-in-time supply chains which may be very cheap in normal times, may be lacking in resilience in times of crisis. The third long run consequence, I think, is that we should expect a wave of defaults coming over the next few years. We went into this crisis uh, with more debt as a fraction of GDP in the global economy than we had in the beginning of 2007. So debt was a big issue that we were facing, even without COVID-19. And of course, the measures which have been taken by government mean that business has had to take on a lot more debt to try and survive the shutdown of the economy. And government has seen a significant increase in its own debt, which it will have to deal with. The household sector, by contrast, has actually had the opportunity to acquire financial assets or repay debt. So I don't think we'll see bigger debt problems in the household sector as a result of COVID-19. But we certainly should expect to see defaults in the business and government sectors around the world, whether that's 
banking sector in Europe, whether it's small developing poor countries, whether it's the large emerging economies, whether it's the Chinese financial system. There's plenty of scope for defaults. And the risk is, I think, that just as in 2007, you may just get a small number of defaults, but market sentiment is triggered and people start to worry about the fact that there could be a much wider wave of defaults. So even a small event in itself can have quite significant long-run consequences. And I think there will be uh, changes in, in that area and we should expect defaults. I'll come back to that when I come to the fifth point in a minute. The fourth point is about inflation. I think there are reasons to suppose that the long run consequence of this is likely to push up inflation uh, rather than push it down. Most of the inflation forecasts at present have inflation being very low. In the short run, that may be the case. Demand is weak, but then supply is being constrained. Not obvious what the short run effect is. And I think we shouldn't trust the measures of inflation at present because a normal collection of statistics is impossible to make now. That the medium to long run effect, I think, will be affected primarily by the relationship between governments and central banks. The question of uh, whether or not central banks will be able to control inflation is not a technical one, because although we've been worrying in recent years about the difficulty that central banks might have in coping with a downturn when interest rates were close to zero, no one has ever doubted the ability of central banks to deal with an upturn in the economy and a rise in inflationary pressures because central banks can simply raise interest rates and there's no limit to that. So if central banks retain their independence, then inflation should not in the medium to long run be a problem. But the issue is, will they retain their independence? And here the question is, will the current events that have been occurring lead to a situation of fiscal dominance in which governments basically instruct central banks to print money to finance their expenditures. It's hard to judge whether that will happen or not. The biggest risk, I think, is that central banks have jumped into this crisis by making very large commitments of quantitative easing and new lending schemes. Now, there is something a little strange about that. Because as I said earlier, with the economy in shutdown, the last thing we really want to do is to have a massive demand stimulus now. That needs to wait if we need one until the economy is free to expand and operate normally. So introducing substantial stimulus now is a bit odd. Equally, the risk of central banks creating new lending schemes is they start to do things which are thought of as fiscal actions. That is, they are not just buying government debt, they are lending or buying assets issued by the private sector or by levels of government below the federal level. This is clearly an issue for the European Central Bank and it's also become an issue for the Federal Reserve in the United States, where what they have done is to take upon themselves decisions that discriminate between different borrowers and different issuers of financial instruments. So some communities in the US have complained that they're too small to be eligible for the Fed schemes. This is politically contentious. And just as we saw after the financial crisis a decade ago, Congress is quite capable of turning around and saying, well, what you did in the crisis may have been a good idea for the economy, but it should have been carried out under the authority of the Treasury and not the central bank and then we're going to clip the wings of the central bank and limit your powers in the future. That happened in Dodd-Frank in the legislation after 2008. And it's possible that governments may re react to this crisis by saying, if central banks are going to do things which are very like fiscal policy, then actually it may be a good thing to do, but governments need to have more say, more influence as to what happens. And that can happen by changing central bank mandates, reducing formal independence, or simply changing the nature of the people who are appointed to run the central banks. That's the risk to inflation on the upside. And the very last point I want to make 
the fifth point about the long run is that there are opportunities here for investors and for banks. One would expect that after this episode, there will be a significant wave of consolidation and mergers as companies which cannot survive decide that the best future is indeed to form a merger with other companies. That will increase concentration, which will raise issues for competition policy. But there will, I think, be a lot of opportunities for takeovers and mergers over the next couple of years. And the last is that those operating in financial markets will undoubtedly remember the criticism which everyone in the financial sector received during the financial crisis. Here is an opportunity to support clients in the real economy who are definitely suffering first uh, by demonstrating that finance has a really important role to play in supporting businesses. That's banks in terms of providing loans to small and big companies now, but other forms of finance as well. And there'll be plenty of opportunities, I think, for portfolio investors in thinking about how the economy might change as we come through and come out of this. There is no ability to use probabilities or quantitative predictions to make those judgments, but plenty of opportunities to think through what is likely to happen to the economy and to keep challenging the stories we tell ourselves about how, well, how the economy will emerge from this crisis as we now start to come out of the shutdown and into the sunny, sunny period of the summer when we hope we can start to meet other people again. So let me stop there and throw it open to questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mervyn, for uh, for very interesting remarks. And I think there's a lot of things for, for, for Bo and me, and we can see a lot of questions coming in from the audience here to uh, to pick up on. I think where we will start is a little bit on this central, uh, central banking uh, um, fiscal uh, and also fiscal dominance side. So basically what you are saying and the way I'm hearing you is that you are saying because there's a little bit, because central banks have gone so far, both with respect to basically, you can call it fiscal dominance, and also because you can say, if you look at, for example, the Fed, they are going down and, and being a little bit, you can say, picking which companies should have, should, you should lend to nearly, that there is a risk of, uh, you can say, central bank independence. Because you can say the account argument could, could, could be that what is the problem for central banks to continue to, you can say, buy all these debt, at least if you look at government debt, as long as you don't have inflation. I mean, what, 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 then, then, you know, then they can continue and they've been struggling to have inflation for 10 years. So interested to hear your reflection on that, whether that, whether you, you could see it from that side also. So I think there are two issues here. One is how much government debt should central banks buy? And you're certainly right in suggesting that in current circumstances, central banks could probably buy quite a lot more without there being an imminent risk of inflation. And therefore, it would, would be quite consistent with their policy to maintain price stability. And in that sense, central banks won't generate inflation if they uh, buy more government bonds. I think that the risk comes from central banks deciding to go beyond that and to choose private sector instruments to buy or instruments issued by lower levels of government. Because those decisions are ones which are about the allocation of credit in the economy. And they are decisions which governments are elected to take. And I think the risk to central banks is that if they move into the area of fiscal policy, then a natural question to ask is, well, we don't delegate fiscal policy to an independent institution. We have an elected government deciding fiscal policy. If central banks are going to do fiscal policy in future, then governments ought to have more control over central banks. And once you get to that point, there is a risk, no, no more than that, but there's a risk that governments will find it irresistible to use the instrument of quantitative easing to ensure that whatever level of spending they'd like to engage in, they will finance it through central bank purchases of government debt. And if that goes far enough, then you're on the slippery road to higher inflation. So I don't think there is a problem provided central banks are in control and provided central banks stick to their mandate and avoid fiscal policy. But where they come into proximity with fiscal policy decisions, they will be well advised to let the, the, the Treasury <clears throat> make that decision. 
the central bank can act as an agent for the treasury, but it shouldn't be the principal decision maker in respect of those credit allocation decisions. So, so I guess what you are saying, a lot of sympathy with that view, uh, Mervyn, is that they should stick to government debt, basically. That's to some extent what yeah. you are saying. Um, and then, yeah, and, and then there is a question coming from the floor in terms of, let's say, and I also have some sympathy because I think what is going on in the fiscal monetary domain now, that maybe there is, which is something the market is underpricing a little bit, an inflationary risk further out there. But, 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 uh, and, and then the, there is a question coming from the floor, do, do you see a risk of stagflation further out? Let's say, not right now, but let's say a, a couple of years down the road. Well, I think the... I won't use the phrase stagflation because that's been used in particular circumstances in the past. But the phrase which came back into discussion after the financial crisis was secular stagnation. And I think there is still a risk of that because the the causes of it, in my view, were seriously distorted saving rates in different economies, uh, both in... Um, economies in, in Asia, but also in Europe and North America. And some countries were saving too much and some too little. And we hadn't found a way in which we could ensure that market prices adjusted to bring saving rates into line with something that was consistent with stable, positive economic growth. And the result was that we had a lot of excess capacity. So you know, both in China and Germany, you've got excess capacity in the export sector. That needs to be worked off. And unless you can shift resources easily from one sector to another, that takes time. And it's accompanied inevitably by slow productivity growth and slow economic growth. Now, the sad thing is that since the financial crisis, we didn't actually deal with the underlying causes of this distortion. And so the reasons for secular stagnation have persisted. And they were there at the beginning of this year when COVID-19 hit. So although I don't think COVID-19 has exacerbated those problems, there is still the underlying challenge of ensuring that the world as a whole can reallocate resources across sectors in order to get back to positive economic growth. And that's one thing that may continue to hold us back not created by COVID-19, but simply that COVID-19 didn't get rid of it. And that's one thing which I think does still lead to the possibility of, of, of low growth. Uh, and, and of course, that may well be accompanied by pretty low inflation as well. So we'll just have to see. The, the risk to inflation in the longer term, I think, are not to do with the rate of economic growth. They're to do with decision making about how much money gets printed. I would agree with that. I mean, just following up, now you are mentioning circular stagnation back to, uh, to Sommer's famous speech in, 19, in, in 2013. You also talked about that as long as R is lower than G, as, as long as normal growth is whole, low, higher than, than, than interest rate, then you have this room, which I think Blanchard has also talked about, to basically, uh, I mean, have, have more debt. And, 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 and I think that is a little bit been the tone, at least in, in policy circles, the way I interpret it, the last couple of years. And then I guess also, I think a, le a learning from the last global financial crisis was, was that QE is pretty forceful. So I would think that policymakers this time, I'm interested to hear your view, view, given also your very, very strong policy background, they will be more reluctant to take back fiscal and monetary stimulus than they were after GFC. Uh, so if you think of it from a, from a fiscal point of view, do you do you agree with that? And do you also see that there could be this shift from, you can say, uh, social insurance policy, unemployment benefits, and all these kind of things, until more fiscal stimulus? Or, or, or how do you see it? How, how do you, you read the, the policymakers in terms of how they're going to move forward with this? Well, I very much share your view that policymakers will not introduce austerity in the way that they did after the financial crisis, say in 2000 and in 10 was that that was the turning point when countries were making decisions about fiscal consolidation but i think the circumstances are very different now and they justify two different responses there was real concern about the interest rate on sovereign debt in 2010. Uh, it, the british interest rate on government borrowing at 10 years was exactly the same as that in italy so that people were worried that the 
differences in interest rates across countries justified significant concern about the need for fiscal consolidation back then. Now I think we're in a position where interest rates for many countries are clearly very low and it wouldn't require much by way of positive economic growth to ensure that R was less than G, in which case, as long as you're not running a large primary deficit, then the ratio of debt to national income will steadily decline over time. And I think the whole point about having a national debt is precisely to deal with this kind of crisis, COVID-19, a war, in this case against a virus rather than against another country. But this kind of big event is precisely why we have a national debt, to allow it to jump up during the crisis and then slowly and steadily bring it back down again. Um, and I think it's very, that's very different. So I'm, I, I would expect not just that governments will want to maintain expenditure and not to run the risk of suppressing economic growth by introducing austerity, but they would actually have good economic reasons for not doing it because R is less than G and we should allow debt to rise in exactly these kinds of circumstances. And, and, and what about b before giving, because I think we'll pick up on some of the other interesting things, but just, for, just to final this point, uh, uh, Mervyn, in terms of monetary policy, um, what and obviously where you are such a big expert, wh what do you see here? I mean, they, they have been quite creative, I think, also this time, but also moving forward. You basically said earlier, you signal a little bit that they have gone quite far already in a, at a very early stage. But what about going forward where maybe stimulus is needed when you open up? Could they be creative around, maybe from a more US perspective, yield curve control, other things where they can learn from each other? What, what do you see in terms of what they could do going forward and what could be useful in, in your view? Well, perhaps my view is a rather extreme one, but I think monetary policy has done what it can. And I think there isn't really a great deal of scope for monetary policy to do more. Monetary policy is very much a counter-cyclical instrument. We're not facing a conventional business cycle, and we're 10 years after the downturn that followed the financial crisis. So I don't think that actually monetary policy really is the instrument to make much difference at this stage. I think this is really all about governments and, and fiscal policy. So I think that to think about more forward guidance, yield control, would not be a very sensible direction to, to go down. Uh, yield control, in a way, is abandoning central bank independence. If you say to, if you promise to keep the yield on, say, 10-year government bonds below a certain level, then you are handing control of monetary policy over to the Treasury. And people seem to have forgotten the experience after the Second World War in the United States, when the Federal Reserve was constrained to follow yield control, to keep the yield on long-term government bonds below a certain level. And it fought against it for several years and eventually signed an accord in the early 1950s with the US Treasury, under which the Fed no longer had to follow yield control. And at that point, and only then, was it able to raise interest rates to contain inflation. And I think it would be a big mistake to follow those uh, instruments because essentially it would be both giving up central bank independence and doing something which is economically, I think, unnecessary. And the final point is, if central banks want to generate more stimulus now, there will be no shortage of government debt for it to buy. So I, I don't think that's going to be an issue. There is a problem clearly in the euro area, because there the difficulty is that without there being a formal fiscal union, it's very hard to know what is the debt that you would buy. And if you start to buy Italian debt rather than German debt, you're creating exactly the same problems for the challenge to central bank independence as you would do within an economy like the United States if you decide to buy debt issued by Illinois rather than Massachusetts. If I may just follow up on this, Mervyn, um, you're, you seem to be arguing that, it, that there's basically a fine balance between uh, the central bank doing enough and then doing too much. So I just want to ask you a very specific question. There is obviously a role for, for the central bank to play in monetary policy to sort of enable uh, the fiscal policy response. But 
have central banks already gone too far or is it sort of just about right now? So I don't think they've gone too far in the sense that I don't think the asset purchases that have been made this calendar year have had an enormous effect. Uh, I don't think they, in a sense, they've carried out in advance purchases that they might have wanted to make further down the road. And I think that one of the potential benefits was that with such a large rise in government debt and government expenditure in a short period of time, it made some sense to smooth the sales of that government debt to the private sector over a period of, say, six to 12 months. And the central bank can help that process by buying the government debt up front and then buying less debt or selling it six to 12 months down the road. So I think so far it's it's okay. But I don't believe that further significant uh, asset purchases will make much difference to the path of the economy now because this is being determined by a mixture of uh, government restrictions and then easing of restrictions. And on the other hand, the response of the private sector to that easing. And the idea that people are going to say, you know, I would love to go to a crowded restaurant if only the interest rate was another 50 basis points lower or there were a bit more asset purchases. That's not what's going to drive them to go back to restaurants and spend money again. It will be a feeling that they're safe and there's no risk of catching the disease by going to a crowded restaurant. So I think it's going to be perceptions by the private sector of how safe it is to take public transport, to go back to work, to spend money in various directions, to fly to various countries. That's going to be the critical thing. And I don't think that uh, changes in monetary policy will have much effect on that. Right. Um, if I may take you back to, to your speech uh, for just a short while, uh, we talked about, you talked about uh, the role of banks and obviously the last cri crisis in 08 and 09 being a, a banking and a financial crisis. And obviously one of the key sort of measures that came out of that was uh, banking oriented reform and regulatory measures. Um, how important do you think sort of everything that we did post the financial crisis in terms of shoring up the banking system, how important has that, that been for the resilience of the banking system in the current crisis? Um, and also, um, how important do you think the sort of the health of the banking system is in terms of enabling the monetary policy response to actually feed through into the real economy? So I think the measures put in place after the financial crisis were crucial in ensuring that this crisis didn't lead to another financial crisis. Because I think if we had gone into COVID-19 with the same degree of leverage in the banking system and shortage of liquid assets, then we have had a massive financial crisis as well. Because the, the problem facing banks now is not that the loans they're making today will necessarily go sour. It's that the loans they made last year, the year before, and the years before that, that looked very sensible loans at the time, may now not get repaid if too many businesses fail during this shutdown period. And governments have tried very hard. Maybe they should have done even more, but they certainly spent a lot of money in trying to prevent failure of businesses. But even so, it looks as if a lot of businesses, and indeed a lot of jobs, <clears throat> will disappear in the short run and eventually come back, possibly quite quickly. But once the businesses have gone, those loans won't get repaid. And that would have, I think, caused enormous concerns about the capital buffers of the banking system in most countries of the world if we had not done more to raise the resilience in the way that was done after 2008-9. And, and you're right that the state of the banking system is fundamentally important in ensuring that monetary policy can work. So a healthy banking system is important, not just to service the real economy, but to provide the central bank with a channel through which its monetary policy can operate. Um. Obviously, before we, we sort of came into this uh, virus-related shock, uh, both the ECB and, and, uh, and the Federal Reserve were sort of either uh, just about to begin or, or fairly um, long in their process of reviewing their, their mandates and, and their policy frameworks and so forth. 
Um, so there's a, there's a specific question here. Um, do you think, given that we're now sitting in a, in a really deflationary shock, uh, and obviously the central banks have been having difficulties in raising inflation I in, in what was uh, actually the longest U.S. expansion, um, do you think that central banks should only target uh, inflation? And, uh, and if yes, uh, do you think that they can actually be credible in that target? Or should they sort of fundamentally change what they focus on? So I don't think the problems that we've faced in the last 10 years are the result of thinking about inflation as the mandate for the central bank. And I think there's a lot of um, very dangerous and misleading analysis of saying, if only we change the mandate, then our problems will go away. And this is true only in a very narrow economic model of how monetary policy works. And it's a a failing which uh, comes from economists not appreciating the significance of radical uncertainty and confusing their model with the world. Models give insights, they're not literal descriptions of the world, but too many economists, especially in the monetary area, have been using their model as if it was the world and drawing strong conclusions from it. We have lots of challenges at present resulting from the state of the economy. Uh, the secular stagnation that we saw, the shutdown from COVID-19. None of these are things that are easy to handle through conventional monetary policy responses. So I don't think changing the mandate will suddenly remove that issue. It won't suddenly mean that monetary policy will become more effective. The period in which nominal income targeting, for example, some people have recommended nominal income targeting, but the period when nominal income grew most uh, in a most stable way, was exactly the same period when central banks had inflation targets. And I think the mistake with thinking about inflation targeting is to assume that it's a mechanical response in which you literally target inflation 18 months ahead. It isn't. It's a framework in which central banks talk about monetary policy, explain it in terms of what it means for inflation. But the, the, the dual mandate of the Fed is in practice very close to the single mandate of inflation targeting of the Bank of England, which in turn is very close to the two pillar strategy adopted by the European Central Bank. What matters is that you focus on what you can control in the, in the long run. And don't kid yourself that central banks are the only game in town. And therefore, whatever policy problem we come across, central banks have to have the answer for it. So I'm not a great fan of fiddling around with mandates. It is not the problem is not the mandate, the problem is what is going on in the economy. Do we understand it? What should we be trying to do about it? And in the medium to long run, yes, I do think that provided governments take the measures that they need to take to ensure that positive economic growth can be achieved again, we rebalance the world economy, then once we've done that, then central banks will be in a position where they can raise interest rates back to more normal levels and be able to control either uh, uh, higher inflation than they would wish or lower inflation than they might wish, get back to a, the sort of time that we had in the period of inflation targeting from, say, early 1990s through to 2007. I think, let, I think Paul and, and myself, we want, and also for comments from the floor, we, let, let's shift a little bit uh, topics also, because we still have a little bit time left, uh, Mervyn, and shifting into a little bit of uh, maybe also referring back to the concept about radical uncertainty. You mentioned in your speech before that you think you can say the epidemic models was good in having a feeling of that it's going to start slowly, then it's going to be very fast and it's going to come off. But, the, uh, but my question to you is, do you think some governments took the uh, models too literally in terms of trying, in terms of, and had that too much of an impact on their policy in terms of locking down. I'm thinking about, for example, these Imperial College papers where uh, where you, it was quite clear, I mean, there was prediction, and maybe it is just a framework, but is that an example where, where, we, where policymakers too, took some of these models too literally and that impacted their policy decision? Yes, absolutely. They, they were taken too literally, and one reason for that was that it was very convenient for politicians to be able to argue that they were doing what the science told them to do. But the science didn't tell them what to do. They had to use judgments 
and the science was never in a position to give that precise quantitative prediction from which you could then draw policy. And it's exactly the same with economic models. The economic models do not give you precise, accurate, quantitative predictions of where the economy or where inflation will go, enabling you to calibrate interest rates to <clears throat> you know, so many basis points. They, they give you insights, and you have to think it through for yourself. So I think this is one of the great dangers of, of using these models. And I'll give you the proof of this. The man who, there are two people in the UK who did, who wrote the textbook on models of epidemiology. Uh, Robert May, an Australian, Bob May, who eventually became professor in Oxford and then government chief scientist in the UK, um, president of the Royal Society. And Roy Anderson of Imperial College, who was also a government scientist at, at times and provost of, uh, of Imperial College. And they wrote the textbook. And earlier this year, as the epidemic was starting, Roy Anderson wrote an article with two others. And he talked about these models. And he said they're incredibly useful for teaching purposes. That is, they help you to understand the nature of an epidemic. What they do not do is give you a quantitative prediction because such predictions depend upon knowing various parameters which we cannot possibly know at this stage. We may know more as the epidemic evolves, but even then we do not know the parameters that govern, govern uh, our behavioral responses in terms of willingness to go to work, willingness to follow the restrictions imposed by government. We just don't know those parameters. And the model is too simple compared with the complexity of the true science of the virus. So use them for the purposes for which they were intended. That is to give us a qualitative guide to how an epidemic evolves. Incredibly important and valuable insights into, into epidemics. But don't fool yourself into thinking that the, you turn a handle, the computer comes out with some numbers and the government looks at the number coming out on the printout and knows what it has to do. It doesn't. So the politicians did indeed overinterpret the models. Mm. So before uh, before wrapping up, um, I just want to ask you sort of uh, the last pointy uh, question because obviously one of the things that a uh, few people on, and models specifically could have forecasted is obviously um, the, e the, the, U the UK's forthcoming exit from, from the EU. So uh, given where you sit, uh, sort of in the epicenter of, of many things, but specifically also British politics, where do you think we stand on, on Brexit and what should we expect uh, going forward? So maybe three, three brief points on this. One is I don't believe the long run economic consequences of Brexit will be that significant. The trading under WTO rules is what we do already with most countries in the world, and we can do it perfectly satisfactorily with Um, the rest of the EU. So that's, that's, in a sense, the most damaging outcome in terms of trade, is to trade under WTO rules. In the long run, I don't think this is going to be very significant for GDP as a whole. Some sectors may suffer a bit more than others, but no, it's, it's, isn't, it's not a first order change. Second thing I'd say is that it's unclear whether there will be a free trade agreement or not. On the face of it, there are very big differences of principle between the EU and the UK government. The EU has made a political decision to say that the UK will be offered a free trade agreement only if it agrees to abide by the regulatory framework of the EU and hence by the oversight of the European Court of Justice. It hasn't done that in any other free trade agreement and it's not a common feature of any free trade agreement. The UK takes the opposite view, which is we are, we are leaving the European Union precisely in order to regain control over the legislation that governs activities in the UK. So it would be pretty absurd to agree to abide by EU regulations and judgments of the European Court of Justice. So this will come to a head in the next couple of weeks at the summit. And I think at this stage, it's almost impossible to judge. The politicians are desperate for an agreement on both sides. They'd love to have it. <clears throat> Whether they can do it is unclear because we're at the point now where it's difficult to fudge an agreement. 
That, that was done back in December. The agreement was fudged somewhat there. It may be difficult to do it now. Uh, the politicians will be desperate to sign an agreement, but there is a lot of difference of view on principle between them. We don't know what will come out, but we don't have to wait long to discover. And the third and last point I'd make is that um, the, I don't think the UK will wish to postpone the decision about the nature of the long-run trading relationship with the EU. That can be decided now because the differences are on principle. Either we compromise and agree or we don't. If we try and postpone this decision, <coughs> excuse me, nothing will happen. We'll, we'll be back in the same position six months from now. So they'll, they'll want to get on and decide it now. The unclear thing is whether the UK will actually be ready to implement a new trading arrangement on the 1st of January because businesses have still not been given the information they need in order to prepare for the customs VAT arrangements that would follow <clears throat> from trading under WTO rules. In the long run, that can be managed quite easily. But in the short run, there are challenges. And <clears throat> I don't think you can rule out the possibility of a last minute extension of the transition period solely in order to give people a bit more time to prepare. But I don't think we should expect an extension of the decision on that long run trading relationship. Um, and that we will have to see what comes out of it. I think the the time is uh, up, uh, Mervyn. Uh, it's uh, I think it's 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 two thirty UK time, three thirty Copenhagen time. So thanks so much for 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 your time, uh, and and all all your insights. I think it was a very very interesting, very grateful to have you on on this webinar. And hopefully next time, you can be here in in Copenhagen at a sunny, let's say May next year. So thanks a lot, Mervyn. I should very much, I should very much like to be there. Thank yeah. you all for this. Thank you, Mervyn. And I think Bo and me will just uh, conclude a little bit, maybe in terms of takeaways from uh, Mervyn's interesting presentation, maybe starting with you, Bo, uh, a key takeaway from your side. Yeah, so uh, the the team that I uh, that I run and, and, uh, and the investment process that we oversee is, is very much uh, founded in the principles of the book Super Forecasting by Philip Tetlock. And obviously, that's sort of a scientific approach to forecasting. And, and one of the things that I take away is uh, obviously we're, we're living in a time of, yeah. of radical uncertainty and, and obviously some of these things are super difficult to forecast. We are very humble about that um, already. Uh, but I think I'll be a little bit even more humble. Uh, and we actually chatted this. with him about it before, yes, also, right? Because I think he writes a little bit about it in his book yep. also. Yeah. So uh, you and me better write, read his, his new book. Um, I think one thing which came across fr from my side was his focus on very much the fiscal dominance, criticizing a little bit ban central banks clearly here, right? That they have gone too far, uh, not buying government debt, but basically going down and buying private debt. And, and the danger here is not the inflation side necessarily, at least on that side, but that's the independent side. And that may create inflation further down the road, which I think is perfectly fair. And actually something I agree with that there is a little bit of an inflationary risk. Maybe the market is, is disregarding a, a bit now. Um, I think we will have to, to end here. This uh, end the series of webinars which replaced our Nordic Summit. We have talked uh, like uh, Bo and myself today with the uh, key former policymakers, decision makers, economists, experts regarding different aspects of the COVID-19 crisis. I hope the webinars have provided insights into your own thinking. I definitely think it has for Bo and me today. I hope the same from your side uh, regarding the crisis. If there are webinars you have not seen, so remember we have had four, uh, eight webinars uh, over the last one and a half months, we will tomorrow distribute links to all of them so, uh, so, so that you will be able to see them there. And also within the next hour or so, we will send out a feedback survey covering all eight. Uh, and it should only take you two minutes. Very grateful if you have time to, to give feedback. So thanks a lot from my side. And thank you very much for listening in today. Thank you.